Fact one, we live in a country regarded as a true beacon for free enterprise, entrepreneurship, and con uh, commerce. Fact two, in most statistical regards, we live in a country that is the most religiously devout and the most religiously diverse in the developed world. For 16 years, I've worked as a consultant in, with businesses and large organizations around the country and around the world. And over that 16 years, I spend nearly every single day talking about fact one, rigorously, debating it, improving it, etc. In 16 years, in no meetings ever, in any formal way, has fact two ever come up. Why? I want to tell you a story about my own very unexpected, very surprising, and very odd spiritual awakening. At the core of my argument about how fact one and fact two need to talk to each other a lot more in my profession or in the professions that you choose or may be in, is this belief that there's something very distinct between diversity and pluralism. Diversity is a statistical observation. It says people that are different live or work in proximity. Pluralism takes that demographic fact and it makes it active. It makes it collaborative. It turns it to action. It turns it to something new and different and good. And what I believe in my own work and in the work that many of you all will do or do is that we have to very consciously and aggressively seize the diversity that we have and turn it more aggressively into pluralism. So one qualification on my talk today. What is this not? This is not a homily. This is not a sermon. This is not a prayer. Uh, I have absolutely no qualifications as uh, a relig religious leader. Uh, and in fact, uh, I have probably equal qualifications as a 6'8 person of being the leading jockey on the winning horse at the Kentucky Derby uh, as I do of actually being a qualified religious leader. So let's make it very clear. My intent here today is not to try to describe theology to you. Instead, I want to describe how these two facts intersect in my role as a leader and consultant in the business world. And so I want to start with my own personal story on how I got here. And it really begins with a series of what I would describe as near misses. Somewhere in my brain, these things were colliding, but I could never put them together. And the near misses are quite interesting. So the biggest one was I spent a year in Mumbai, India with my wife. And during the week, I took all the pieces of fact, all the facts in fact one, and every day engaged with leading Indian companies eager to learn about American enterprise and American commerce. And then on the weekend, my wife and I traveled around India and experienced what is probably the greatest set of religious diversity anywhere in the world. We saw Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, Jainism, Sikhism, and those are just the big ones. You find even narrower, more interesting and intriguing religions all over that beautiful country. And somehow, during that entire year, I never put those two things together. And I will say we had one instance where they came together, and it was not a very good one. Uh, and so uh, that's a picture of me in the Indian uh, Hindu festival called Holi. It's the festival of colors. Uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to experience, what actually happens is you take dye, and you, it often involves water, and you throw it all over everybody. And so that is me. One of our friends invited us to their party, and we were covered in dye. And to say something about the intersection of capitalism and religion in India, the chemical industry apparently in India isn't quite as well regulated. Uh, and so the dyes that we use, the permanent effect this had on my family, or the nearly permanent effect, was the dye that got on my wife's blonde hair was pink. Uh, and it wasn't as washable as we thought it was. So the only impact India really had was for a year after that event, my wife had this pink dye in her hair uh, that no matter what we did, regardless of whether she dried, tried to dye it again or not, it wouldn't come out. And so that was my one instance is where this facts came together. And clearly, there's more there. I've had other near misses. A great weekend spent uh, over Christmas at the Vatican with my family where we found deeper meaning and understanding. Weddings funerals, 
convocations. All of these were opportunities to actually reflect and realize that in this country, those true great facts may have more to say to each other than they did. But I missed them all. And so when did I start to explore this topic more? What was my source of exploration and understanding? And it turns out it was a really bad catered plated meal in a very stuffy eating club in downtown Chicago on a day where I was very grumpy, very tired, and not remotely interested in business or religion. But at this lunch, I met a person who changed my life. And so I met a gentleman named Ibu Patel. Many of you have met him. If you haven't, maybe you've read about him. And if you haven't done any of those, read his book, find him out, grab a cup of coffee, whatever you have to do. Um, here's a person who, in one moment, changed my life. And so he sat next to me at this lunch, and we started talking. And he started sharing. He started opening my mind. We finished lunch. I didn't notice anyone else at the table. We walked together back to our office and my, his office, which happened to be right across the street. He invited me up to his office. We kept talking. We looked at our watches and realized the day was over uh, and that we'd been talking that entire time. And what was so fascinating for Ibo, for those of you who don't know him, is Ibo is leader, a leader of a fantastic movement in the US called the Interfaith Movement. And he's focused on taking these differences, not in the business world, uh, but on college campuses, and getting people to turn them into action, into service, into real benefits. And so I was a convert after this conversation. The interesting thing is I wasn't a convert to his religion, Islam. He didn't spend one minute trying to convince me that I should change my religion. Instead, he converted me to this notion that diversity was one thing and pluralism is another thing. It had nothing to do with business, but I left that room saying, wow. Why is it in 16 years no one I know at this fantastic company that I work with has ever thought of putting these two things together? And so it became my mission as a convert. So where do we start this conversation? In the world that I live in, the business world, religion is taboo. So on the one hand, you have religion as something that is highly politicized. The images are terrible. You think of terrorism, you think of intolerance, etc. On the other hand, something has happened in American business. It's the privatization of religion. So religion, something that is actually about yourself and your community, has turned to something that everyone expects as something. You should keep that to yourself. I should keep that to myself. I should not bring this into the workplace. This is something for my home. And so that's the baseline that I started thinking about this. And these are just facts. This is if you, you know, you're, you're in a business meeting somewhere in America, these are the two things that sit beneath the surface. So I started to do some research. The first thing I did is I, my company has existed for over 50 years. Over those 50 years, we have studied everything. And you go to our knowledge management system, you can type in whatever you want. You can type in oil fields in Nigeria and you'll get 1,000 PowerPoint pages. You can type in telecom in Thailand, and you get get 1,000 PowerPoint pages. And on most policy topics, you can see the same thing. So I tried some religious phrases. Clearly in 50 years, given the prevalence of religion, we must have said something. And so the results were just fascinating to me. So the, one of the first things I typed in was the most widely, piece, ri widely uh, read book in the history of the world, the Bible. So I typed in the Bible. And the beauty is the two things that came up. The first one is you know, the highly, highly, highly devout uh, title, Colombian Banking Market Bible, followed up by a report on private equity. Uh, and so, OK, a private equity in the Bible, I'm not sure how we got to that association. But our brilliant algorithm, that was choice number two. So clearly, it was validating my hypothesis that we really haven't found a way to put these two things together. So I started to do and gather some basic information to start engaging my colleagues, not with my own point of view, but in a series of dialogues and questions so that they may help me. Because it is a very diverse group of people I work with. Maybe they could help me think through this. And so I gathered some anecdotal evidence, some early evidence to get people thinking. I did some survey work. 
and we convened and started talking about these things. And so one of the first ideas was, is there a link between religion and leadership? And again, basic Google. Type in best leaders in, the modern, in modern history. And seven or eight names consistently come up. The three most common names you see are Gandhi, Abe Lincoln, and Martin Luther King. What's fascinating is you think about the, the way that their speeches talk to one another, the way the predecessors or the followers of Abraham Lincoln built on what, the way that Martin Luther King learned from Gandhi, and the way that interfaith understanding and religion were so core to their definition of leadership. And then if you think about the business world, this is where it gets more complicated. This is where I need to be careful. But John D. Rockefeller, Sam Walton, often regarded as two of the most innovative, dramatic, game-changing CEOs ever, faith was core to their business principles. Faith was core to their business strategy. Now, I need to be careful there. Was that core, was it causal? Is it correlated? Was it co-opted? Uh, was it actual? I don't know. Um, but nonetheless, if you read any history of those two individuals, you see that religion, nonetheless, was constantly swimming near the surface. So I wanted to start to think about that a bit. And then I gathered some other really interesting evidence from a book I would highly encourage everyone to have a look at. And this book is by a fantastic Harvard professor named Robert Putnam, who developed this incredibly rich set of data on religion in American civic life, not business, but civic life. But it points a way forward. And so Robert Putnam wrote a book called American Grace. And in American Grace, he basically looks at American religiosity and how that ties to civic participation. And the relationship, again, correlation, not causal. But if you sort people from least religious to most religious on six different measures of not religious participation, but just civic participation, basic things like volunteered for a non-religious cause, and as you see, there's this striking relationship between people who are more religious and the way that they give to all of us as community members in non-religious ways. And so again, this started to get us thinking. And the last thing I did was I just asked my team some very basic questions. And I asked them, let's talk about your own level of spirituality. And as you see, my colleagues, and this is out of 100, many of them viewed religion as something that was very important or important to them. And this is this very secular workplace where we haven't talked about it ever. Then I asked them, what is, role does religion play at our company? And as you can see, the results basically say, it is never discussed. And the last thing I asked them was, OK, what's your hunch? How applicable might this be to our work and what our clients do? And it was interesting, a, a plurality of the folks thought it was highly applicable uh, or applicable. And very few thought it didn't have any applications whatsoever. So again, there's all this evidence to suggest we've got these two things that are so core to who we are, and yet most people are not finding a way to connect them. So I started going deeper into well, how might we apply these. And there's a set of work that my colleagues are doing right now that I think is a perfect illustration of the promise of doing this more frequently. And so this is the notion of purpose and meaning in work. If you think about why most of us consider ourselves spiritual, if even not religious, even if we're atheists, it's finding meaning. It's finding purpose. It's finding a reason to get up in the morning, not just doing what I'm incentivized economically to do. And so my colleagues have started a whole set of work that I would describe as transformational, very different, very fresh, and having dramatic impact that is really moving from the rational side of engaging why an employee would be motivated. Think about an employee in a retail store. I can incentivize them by commanding, giving them economic incentives, giving them rules, et cetera. And we're finding more and more and more is if you want to motivate that frontline employee, if you want to motivate your sales force, if you want to motivate your senior executives, if you want to mo motivate your customer service uh, folks, it's much better, it's much more likely if you start to get to more of the stand, the purpose, the meaning type motivations. Finding, if you're a grocer, why is it that people come to your store? What are the deeper emotional connections that someone might walk in? What kind of baggage and feelings and emotion are they bringing in? And how do you change the way you think about your job to go from stocking a shelf 
to actually really fulfilling a family's need to have a good meal together where they can commune uh, and have a good life. And how do you actually give people a sense of when I come to work every day, there's meaning. And so if you start to look at the work that we're doing there and some of the words on the page here, this is work we're doing. It's very strange for us to be doing highly successful, and this work is work we started in the past year. It's not particularly, um, it's not a thing that we've done for a long time. But phrases like missionary, advocate, um, you know, the whole notion of being much more ethically driven, bringing those things to the surface is something that we are seeing tremendous promise in. But I still think we're doing it pretty unconsciously, uh, not getting deeper as to why some of these things really matter and what it is about humans that make this something that's promising. And so for all this comes together for me in one dramatic, amazing, incredible case study that I think starts to point a way forward on how we intend to onboard some of these ideas and these questions, and perhaps some of you all might think about it as well. And so it's ripped from the headlines, story from the New York Times. And so let's all move to Grand Island, Nebraska. Grand Island, Nebraska, uh, for most of its uh, history, has been an entirely white community. Uh, farming and meatpacking. At the end of the 20th century, you had a wave of Latino migration to populate the plants there. And the community adjusted. And it was some ability to adjust because you had Catholic side by side with mostly Protestant uh, and some similar underlying ethic and moral connections. Then you throw in mass deportation. And so in this community that it's finally found a way to coexist Latino and white. You had scores of Latinos sent back to Mexico because they were here illegally. And you had somebody, a plant manager, who I'm going to guess went to a Midwestern uh, engineering school, probably went to one of Chicago's fantastic MBA programs, and now he or she finds himself as the plant manager in this plant where they've lost many of their workers, and a tragedy has occurred, people are hurt. What they found was that Somali immigrants Muslims are here under refugee status and legal. And so they recruited Somalis into this plant. And so now you have white, Hispanic, and Somali working side by side. And that plant manager did not know what was coming. And this to me goes to the very core of what many of us are going to experience as uh, the United States continues to become more diverse, more religiously diverse, uh, and finds a need to find a way to turn that religiosity, that diversity, into something good. Not in this case, something that turned out very bad. So what happened? So Muslims, uh, practicing Muslims, have very different needs in terms of time for prayer uh, and the obligation and need to do that prayer even during work hours. And so five prayers a day. And you can imagine as the plant manager, that's difficult to accommodate. If you're the Latino worker who just had many of your family members deported, and you suddenly realize that you're losing out on money because there's these new mandatory breaks for prayer, the tension that it set off was awful. Then you bring Ramadan in. And there it got even worse because you had to make massive accommodations for daily fast, the ability to break fast in the evening. And there was a horrible rift where you had Latinos saying, I'm losing pay, Muslims saying, what are you doing? I will quit if you don't accommodate me. And an explosion occurred. And there you have it. Suddenly, this plant manager who just wants to figure out how to process meat uh, finds themselves on the front page of the conflict between diversity and pluralism. And so what I would argue is, and, and look, this, is, this story is yet unfinished. In truth, the, the court system is working this particular thing through. But I would argue is, whether you're in a hospital setting, whether you're in a convenience setting, whether you're in a food setting, uh, or whether you're in a meatpacking setting, all these issues sit beneath the surface with your customers and with your employees. And we have very few tools to deal with them. And so what I would conclude by saying is, there are a couple of things that I think are going to paint, paint, paint the path forward. The first, we all need as leaders and as professionals something I would describe and Ibu describes as an interfaith radar. An interfaith radar is basically having fundamental understanding of the basic premises of the religions and the non-religious that live around us. And most of us lack it. If you ask most people to answer a quiz on the difference between Sikhism and Islam and Hinduism, they would fail miserably. 
And it turns out if you're managing in the 21st century, those things can come to the fold very quickly. So we all need that interfaith radar. The second thing is we all need to much more aggressively start to think about how do I turn this from diversity into pluralism? What are the things I can do in my business as I think about my customers that not only bring out that understanding but turn it to actual dialogue, actual action, actual collaboration. And look, every situation is unique, but we have to wake up every day in diverse settings like this and think about how we might do that. And the last one that I think is also very interesting that's quite unexplored at this point is not only take those things in how we interact with one another, but to start to apply them to business concepts. A lot of the things I talked about actually have application to organization and culture, meaning and purpose. Think about trying to target customers. When nearly 40% of the American population is evangelical Christian, and when I talk to my teams, and the notion of an evangelical Christian is a foreign object to most people who live in most urban settings, you have a massive disconnect between people trying to understand their customer and their actual experience on an everyday basis. And so if you think about the application there, if you think about the application to things like leadership and how we motivate uh, and pull in things like ethics and values, et cetera, there's so much more to mine here. And so ultimately, I think the promise of thinking through this, and right now, in my humble opinion, there are more questions than answers, but the promise is how do you take something that could technically be used as an obstacle, as a bludgeon, as a means of, in some sense, isolating our true selves from one another, how do you turn these concepts in the most religiously diverse and devout country in the world, how do you turn them into bridges of cooperation? And so I haven't figured it out. I'd ask each of you to think about it, uh, and I'm hopeful we'll make progress in the years to come. Thank you.